Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacques Dean. I'm the road superintendent for Kitsap County Public Works, and I'd like to welcome you all to our third public meeting to discuss and share information on the North Kitsap Service Center. Uh, before we start, I have a few housekeeping items I'd like to uh, go over with you. Uh, this is a Zoom meeting, and it is being recorded, just for the record, and the recordings will be available, available to view on our webpage, as shown on, on the slide. And if you've got any, uh, any friends or other interested people that weren't able to attend, they can listen to this recording and get information. During the presentation, all attendees will be muted to ensure audio quality, to make sure everybody can hear what is, what is being shared. Um, we also provide ADA services for anybody who needs those services. We can, we'll provide an interpreter or a translation services for non-English speaking uh, individuals and accommodations for persons with disabilities. So if you have those needs or you know of somebody who does, um, contact, uh, use the contact number on the bottom of the slide and uh, we'll assist those who need it. We also are required to comply with Title VI for public involvement. Title VI, if you don't know, is part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and it requires Kitsap County to be sure that everyone in the affected project area has a chance to be heard and to respond to transportation programs and activities that may, be, may, be, may affect their community. To help with that, we have provided a form. Uh, it's a voluntary form, but it provides us with information about your race, ethnicity, and or gender. You are not required to disclose the information requested in order to participate in, the, to participate in this meeting. But if you would like to provide it, there's a link there as well um, in the bottom, uh, bottom left, uh, left hand side of that screen, or excuse me, right hand side. And uh, questions and comments. When we're done with, the, with our presentation, we'll provide plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, if you are an internet user, if you're on the PC, uh, there's two ways you can do it. You can raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you um, in order, um, or you can actually simply type your question in and, and we'll answer those as well. Uh, for people who have called in, if you dial, dial star nine on your keypad, um, we, and then list your last four digits of your call number, we will call on you to ask your questions. So some introductions from the county side. Um, those in attendance are Commissioner Gelder. He's the North End uh, Commissioner. Andrew Nelson, the Director of Public Works. Joe Rutan, who is the Assistant Director and County Engineer. Uh, he represents the, uh, the road side of Public Works. Dave Tucker, who is uh, the Assistant Director on the utility side of the house. Chris Piercy is the Senior Program Manager for Solid Waste. Uh, Rick Gilbert uh, is the Manager of the Household Hazardous Waste Facilities. Keith Swearingen is our Equipment Services Manager, and uh, Ira O'Neill is our Public Information Specialist. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff uh, Massey to introduce his, uh, the OTAC team. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Massey. Uh, I'm a senior project manager with uh, OTAC Consultants. Um, so I work with Jacques and other stakeholders with the county to uh, develop this project. I coordinate with the consultant team, uh, coordinate activities, and I monitor and control project performance uh, information, including scope, schedule, budget, and expenditures. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm going to let a couple other people who are be presenting this this evening uh, introduce themselves in the presentation when it comes up. Steve E. Walt, he's an architect with OTAC, and the president of Special Waste Associates is David Nightingale. So, done sort of the introductions. Uh, so, the agenda for this open house includes a project overview, really remind everybody what this project is all about, talk about the process to date next steps in the project development, as well as the aforementioned question and answer period. So the overview of the project, we call it the North Kitsap Service Center, but it really has two main functions. One is the road operations and maintenance facility, the other being the household hazardous waste collection facility. 
So as you can see here, uh, some of the main elements of the road operations and maintenance facility is the administrative slash equipment maintenance shop building. So uh, it's a place for, um, you know, the supervisors that work underneath Jacques to uh, manage their folks, a uh, place for uh, road maintenance staff to muster, have uh, a place to have lunch, training, locker room facilities, and a place for equipment services division staff to maintain uh, vehicles for the county. So other elements included uh, include covered parking and storage for materials and vehicles that and, and equipment that needs to be undercover, as well as some other elements, including bulk storage uh, for things like gravel, salt, uh, and some other features like a fuel station and um, a vehicle wash. So the household has this waste collection facility. Again, this is uh, to provide uh, a facility year round in North County. Uh, we'll talk about a reuse shop, um, and the materials are really packaged by the county staff before disposal vendors come take those materials for ultimate disposal. So David Nightingale is going to talk a little bit more about those, and Steve's going to talk about the two buildings in, in the upcoming part of the presentation. I want to talk about the schedule. We always do this. Uh, it's important for people to know. And I should mention that we refine the schedule as project conditions you know, change a little bit, uh, but this hasn't changed material, materially from the last two open houses we've had. Uh, as you can see at the top here, the data collection and analysis phase was conducted very early in the project. Site planning was conducted last year in the blue line here. Uh, the 30% design phase was wrapped up about a month ago or so. And you can see the State Environmental Policy Act, SEPA, Environmental Review. We're working on the SEPA environmental checklist documentation now. Uh, the 60% design phase, we've just commenced with that right now. And we see that the land use permitting will uh, utilize the 60% design documents for that purpose, for the application and the processing of that permit. The 90% design phase will commence after completion of the 60% design. And you can see construction permitting through Kitsap County Community Development will uh, utilize those 90% design documents uh, for the permit application and processing. And then you can see that the 100% design phase should wrap up early in 2023. And this is probably a good time for me to mention now that we've got new team members, and we're really coordinating our activities uh, in the OTAC design team. We are recommending to the county that we increase the duration of this, the 60% design phase a few weeks and have a commensurate decrease in the duration of either the 90% design phase and or the 100% design phase so that we're looking at wrapping up this project design again in early next year. So uh, we've, we've talked about this before. Uh, we talked about some of the key findings in our past open houses. So I don't want to belabor this too much. Just know that the deliverables coming out of this data collection and analysis phase, if you want to look at any of this stuff, again, I'm going to reference the, uh, the project website here. So I'll go ahead and move on from that. Again, another completed phase of this project is the site planning. And the main deliverable from that was what we call the site plan alternatives analysis technical memorandum. Uh, it compared differences between two alternatives that we labeled A and B at the time. So the decision considers cons the uh, consult recommendation from the OTAC team. Uh, also, it seriously considered the public input from the last open house we had in August of 2021, as well as other public comments received. So the county made a decision to go ahead and proceed with alternative A. Um, and that alternative A, it's a, it's a site plan. So it really, uh, we really refine, excuse me, go back. We really refine 
uh, the site plan based upon internal review comments we get from the county, UT members, uh, technical reports that are still coming in, as well as permit review comments that we'll get from the different agencies, including community development. So uh, I thought it was important to kind of revisit uh, what site plan A looks like. It's been refined a little bit here, but uh, you know the main difference between site plan A and B, this being A, is that site plan A keeps wetland C and its 50 foot buffer intact. Uh, so that means a little decreased area for road maintenance operations as well as solid waste uh, operations here at the household hazardous waste collection facility. But we're confident based upon our uh, analysis, we, we've done some, uh, what would you call it, vehicle wheel track analysis to make sure that the big equipment that's gonna be utilizing this facility can maneuver about uh, these different components and that all the program elements can uh, fit on here and provide uh, the function that's needed. And, and one of the uh, other benefits about site plan A, it's smaller space, means less drainage to uh, collect, uh, detain, and, and also do water quality treatment on. And so when I say detain, that is to uh, basically emulate pre-existing flow conditions coming off the project site. We've got more impervious surface that we're proposing. Uh, so detaining the storm water will protect uh, the downstream, protect from downstream stream bank erosion. Uh, some other elements I'd like to mention here is that uh, along the north, west, and southern boundary of the project is a proposed 30-foot buffer. A and I want to mention that 30-foot number because county code requires 20 feet. So. Uh, Kitsap County uh, Public Works has specified that we go an additional 10 feet to provide additional buffer. Um, one of the things that we've refined in the site plan is we wanted to reduce the size and the cost of this underground detention vault. It's fairly pricey. Um, so in order to do that, we found these spaces, these green spaces that I'm pointing to with my cursor, and they are these stormwater treatment wetlands. And so that decreases the size and cost of this underground detention vault. It also helps raise awareness of natural resources and the opportunity for interpretive signage showcasing the county's water as a resource policy. So, you know, the public can come in here, use the household hazardous waste collection facility, see these stormwater treatment wetlands, propose, we propose having some interpretive signage again to showcase uh, that natural resource. And I should mention a couple of things about drainage, all the impervious surfaces, the paved areas, the buildings, they'll all be going through a stormwater sewer system and going through water quality treatment and flow control or detainage. Uh, and uh, for those who are wondering, Wetland C, it's got, you know, some proposed development around it, but there's existing hydrology that comes through this, this basin. There's an existing flow. So that flow will be maintained to uh, maintain the existing hydrology and function of Wetland C before it, 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 uh, it exits out the, the project site towards the south here. So again, uh, I think it's important to show the site plan here. Uh, in terms of the 30% uh, the design phase, yes, it's complete. Uh, it really refined. The activities include refining alternative A site plan to a 30% design level. The thing that also accompanied that was this design report. Again, it's online and the design report it includes lots of discipline narratives. Disciplines could be a geotechnical uh, engineering, architecture, civil engineering, landscape architecture. So it goes through a lot of detail on that. It really sets the tone on 
the final design, some of the options that go into that. So it evaluated options and made recommendations on some of those options. And there was a construction cost estimate uh, and 30% cons complete construction plans that went into that design report. So I think this is the time now I'm going to introduce Steve Ewalt to talk about uh, the buildings. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm Steve Ewalt, uh, Senior Project Manager and Project Architect with OTAC and uh, a teammate of Jeff's. And uh, what we have is uh, we are in the, in the, the throes of the 60% design. So what you see on your screen right now is the the road uh, operations facility, which you'll see is separated into two main areas. To the left of that obvious lines, you see a, a lot of uh, smaller offices, locker rooms, uh, smaller support spaces. And then to the right are the full maintenance bays where we'll have our uh, bridge crane and um, uh, all of the, all of the accoutrement to uh, take care of all of the 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 trucks uh, that you guys use day to day. Um, a couple of things of note here, if you look at the little sneak peek that we have up above of a quick three-dimensional look at where the building is right now. Again, it's, it's in process, so we're still massaging a few of these things. You'll notice that we have some really unique forms that are a throwback to some of the uh, industrial buildings of the past. Uh, and there's a, there's a reason why we like that form uh, of those sawtooth roofs especially. And uh, we're using it again in this. We, are, uh, we always design at OTAC to a lead silver minimum standard, whether we're getting certified or not. Uh, we always try to keep sustainability and longevity in mind when we design. So we like the idea of these sawtooth roof forms because what you can't see is just on that other side, the vertical side of those sawtooth is basically going to be daylighting. So passive daylighting everywhere we can get it. We're using a product called Calwall, which is an insulated glazing panel. It's, uh, it's not vision glass, but so we don't have a lot of solar gain from that, but we do get a ton of really great high natural light into these maintenance bays to, number one, help everybody uh, get the work done in, with, with clear vision, but number two, save a lot on electricity costs over the course of the year. Um, the overhead doors, you'll also see there, we, we're showing them right now as your, your standard overhead doors with the, the two rows of clear vision light. But we are looking into some solid glazing doors with frosted glass to really light this place up uh, without the glare, but with all of the light quality from the, the, natural, uh, the natural light. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention about, about this, this building in particular is we are using um, radiant heat floors to, uh, to heat those bays. Um, as you know, if we, were, if we were blowing a lot of uh, warm air around, every time you open one of those doors, we would be losing it all. But uh, we're finding that these radiant floors are a really efficient system to, uh, to keep the working spaces normalized and comfortable, as comfortable as we can anyway. Uh, the other thing uh, that I forgot to mention about the, uh, the sawtooth roof forms is they are perfectly primed for solar arrays. So our PV panel arrays are oriented to the south and they're going to be structured to have the capacity that we ultimately find uh, that we're gonna need here. Again, that's all in process at the moment. So we don't know exactly how many, how much, or uh, how much power that is going to generate, but it is on the table right now and we're designing for that. And the, the last comment that I would make on this building is it's over 15,000 square feet. So we are deep into a study right now of how much rainwater we can actually capture on the roof of this building and the second building that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, 
we did some really rough calculations and we we are thinking with our first pass there's almost 600,000 gallons of water that will run off these buildings that we're going to try to use in interesting and meaningful ways to uh, to keep that keep that useful before it gets back into the system. Um, so if you want to go to the second building, so this is a quick look at the household hazardous waste collection facility that's on the uh, southwest corner of the property. This is the this is the part of the property that will be open to the public. And uh, I'll let David Nightingale tell you a little bit more about the operation of this, but the way we have uh, organized it and worked the architecture is once again, we're making nods to those architectural moments of the industrial architecture that has worked really well and actually lends itself a little character versus a, you know, a large uh, nondescript you know, personality list box. Um, but the most interesting thing that, that I think that I really like about the fact that folks from the community can bring their unused and leftover um, and surplus hazard or uh, household waste is that we have down in the southeast corner a reuse facility where the community will be able to come and collect for free uh, cleaning materials, paints, etc that would normally be taken out of circulation and into the waste stream, they get a chance at a second life here at this facility. So I think it's a really great project and we're uh, really excited to be incorporating a lot of these great techniques. Oh, and I did, I did also mention, you can't see it in our uh, 3D view here, but there's also a sawtooth roof that we use on this one to get some more natural light from up high into that, uh, the large, uh, bay on the west side of the building. So thanks again, Joe. Thanks, Steve. So uh, I'm going to reintroduce uh, David Nightingale. Again, he's the president of Special Waste Associates. And David, before I go to the next slide, is there anything about the operation of this building you'd like to mention before I move on? No, I think uh, he covered it pretty well. I mean, the larger part of the building there on the left upper side, that's where uh, any waste that comes in would be uh, sorted. Uh, the stuff to reuse would go out back to the public. Uh, but the bays at the top of that uh, building there on the floor plan are where trucks would come. They deliver supplies and it'd also be where uh, waste would be taken off site that can't be reused, uh, but could be recycled off site or be disposed off site. It would go out to a certified hazardous waste company or other companies that uh, manage whatever kind of waste come in from people's homes. I guess uh, maybe I'll, as you go to the next slide, I'll just introduce myself, David Nightingale with Special Waste Associates and uh, my company we're working on, actually, I just did a little mental count. We're working on eight HHW household hazardous waste facilities across the country right now. I've been doing this kind of work uh, since the late eighties in helping communities uh, to develop uh, systems and uh, programs to take uh, household hazardous waste uh, actually help was involved with the uh, pro uh, the existing HHW facility in Kitsap County as well. Uh, but I wanted to show you this map here uh, on the left-hand side of the slide. And uh, just to orient you, on the left edge, that's Bond Road. And if you're coming north on Bond Road, you'd be able to uh, come directly in, turn right onto Lambert Road and in access the, um, the household hazardous waste facility. If you're coming south on uh, Bond Road, you'd have to go down to Gunderson and come around to get there. But the uh, circulation and queuing space, if there happens to be, if you're there on a, a busy Saturday afternoon, for instance, um, there's plenty of uh, uh, space to have cars um, in line ready to go. Uh, where the cars are shown, most of that area would be uh, undercover. So if it's raining, uh, it would be a pleasant place uh, to, you know, come in and have folks uh, receive your household hazardous waste that you have in your garages or under your sink or what have you that you don't need anymore. Things that uh, you just uh, have, have used up and there's some leftovers there. Um, and uh, I guess uh, the other thing to note here is on the right-hand side, I, I uh, a little 
Google Map snapshot. And at the bottom left of that, you'll see there's a uh, pin that says so it has a space facility. That's the existing current household hazardous waste facility serving the whole county. So if you're in Bremerton or um, Port Orchard, you know, it's not that far a drive. But if you're up North County, uh, you know, um, Bainbridge Island, Paulsbo, Kingston, any of those areas, it's a long drive. And so this is going to be a very much more convenient uh, site for everybody in North County uh, to access and not have to burn a whole bunch of petroleum and have a carbon footprint and just take take care of your stuff that you no longer want. Uh, Also, just mentioned that, uh, as Steve uh, talked about, the uh, same sort of sustainability elements, uh, stormwater, natural light, energy efficiency, uh, and and also uh, radiant floors, those sort of things will be incorporated in this building just as much as they will. Uh, also on the site. And um, yes, that's probably it for now, and I'll wait to, to get some questions. Thanks, David. So uh, where are we at right now? Where are we going? Uh, we are in the 60% design phase. We're initiating that or have initiated that a few weeks ago. And we'll talk a little bit about future phases. Uh, so some of the activities, like I said, if you kind of recall back to that schedule, we'll get a chance to take a look at it again here. But uh, the uh, SEPA review uh, is going to be utilizing the 30% plans. Uh, we'll continue to refine those plans for the 60% design submittal. That 60% design submittal will be used for environmental permits between now and, say, fall. Uh, Also, land use permits from Kitsap County Community Development. You see applying for that, you know, at late summer. Uh, The construction permitting, again, through Kitsap County Community Development, will be using uh, the 90% design plans. Once those are finished up, uh, call it early winter. And so the deliverables coming out of that are the 60%, 90%, 100% construction plans. Uh, And those will be coupled with specifications, at least quantity estimate, uh, to form a construction contract manual on which contractors can bid on and the awarded contractor uh, will uh, use those. And the construction management team will use that to administer the construction of this project. So I want to come back to the schedule again. We've seen this before, but this is put in the context of the uh, public engagement plan that we're that we're doing. Uh, so again, uh, the public engagement really like to present new material through the development of the project. So back when we conclude the data collection analysis phase, we had our first public open house. The last public open house we had was towards the end of the site planning phase. So we get the input from uh, the stakeholders on uh, the site plan alternatives A and B. So you can see right now that now that we've uh, concluded our 30% design, we're conducting our open house number three. And then open houses number four and five, we see conducting those at the culmination of the 60 and 90% design phases. And then what we anticipate is once a contractor's got got on board, uh, that the county will have some sort of outreach, public outreach event for, uh, you know, for the construction phase of the project. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jacques and Eirik to wrap up the presentation here. So I just wanted to uh, reiterate the the fact that we do have a project page up on on our county website. It's it's noted at the bottom of this screen, and you'll find a wealth of information about the project at that location. Um, you know, one one particular file that I think would be good is uh, the thirty percent uh, design report. It's kind of a, a a wrap up, a summary of all the various uh, reports and information that we've generated to date. 
And so it's kind of a one-stop shop. There's lots of additional information there. Um, on this screen, you have my contact information as well as IRIX. If you have any other questions um, that come up, maybe later tonight as you're thinking about this project, um, feel free to give me a call at any time and, and we can discuss the project. So with that, I guess we can get the questions and answers. Great, thank you, Jock. Uh, okay, at uh, this time, we will open it up to uh, questions. And um, we did, uh, let's see, we're gonna start with a, uh, a typed question from uh, K Carolyn Zimmers. She asked the question, will you have styrofoam recycling? And uh, I will, um, I will uh, defer to Rick Gilbert to answer that question, please, Rick. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we will not be doing styrofoam collection. Um, this is primarily a household hazardous waste facility, collection facility, and styrofoam is not really considered a hazardous waste. I know it's ubiquitous and sometimes annoying to dispose of, but um, this particular facility footprint, we just don't have the room to do it. Um, we have done styrofoam collections in the past. Um, I don't know what the status is of future collections, but at this time, we're not going to be collecting styrofoam. Great. Thank, thank you, Rick. And Carolyn, thank you for that question. That's a great one. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to go over. We've got uh, a hand raised for uh, Bruce McCain. Bruce, I'm going to unmute you so that you uh, can ask your question verbally. Um, and you should be able to uh, and speak now. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm curious for the house, uh, household waste facility, what, what will you, um, mechanisms will you use to prevent um, hazardous uh, spills from leaking out of the building? Great question, Bruce. Thank you. I, I think uh, David Nightingale can uh, answer that question. Yeah, that, that's great. It's a good question. And um, the facility uh, will be designed to meet the requirements of the Department of Ecology, um, who I actually used to work for in, in this uh, capacity. But it'll have it'll be have an engineered uh, concrete floor and it'll have a secondary containment system within it. So the only the main places you know that would happen is inside the facility or under the canopy, and those will all be protected with secondary containment right there. If you have to drop, you know, uh, a bottle of uh, Clorox or something like that, it can't get out. Uh, there'll be you know concrete there, then it'll be cleaned up right away by the uh, the operators if anything like that should happen. And they're and they're typically very small spill. I don't know anywhere in the country where there has been a any kind of significant release at all. Uh, from these kind of facilities into the environment. Matter of fact, they're designed not to let that happen. Okay. Thank you. I have another question. Hey, Bruce, go ahead. Okay. Um, I noticed that you, you'll be storing, um, um, let's see, you'll be storing um, uh, recycle and, and other kinds of waste over in, Kind of, kind of, on the um, the south side of the property near the near the uh, the, the stream, um, is that uh, will that material be a source of contaminants? Number eighteen on the map, trash and recycling. Yeah. Oh, it's it's right here. Number eighteen. So. So Jacques, you and I were just talking about that. We we need a place to put dumpsters for trash and recycling throughout the site. It's a pretty large site. Uh, remember, the site is about 16 acres. So <clears throat> these places are locations. Uh, I'm sure by code we'll need to uh, put them behind walls, uh, and so we are designated spots to put trash receptacles and as appropriate recycle receptacles. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce, appreciate it. Um, gonna go back to a question um, 
we we do have some folks that have joined us on their phones, and so I'm going to read a, a couple questions that uh, Commissioner Gelder has uh, has answered uh, uh, through the uh, uh, through the uh, question and answer box. Um, Carolyn Zimmers asked the question: Will you have composting for food waste, including meat and proteins? And uh, the answer to that is it's not part of this project. Uh, however, those items are now available. Uh, throughout unincorporated North Kitsap via uh, curbside composting. Um, and let's see, go to the next question. Um, Jim Gro, uh, you asked the question, uh, submitted a question, uh, will this site accept four foot fluorescent tubes? And I will um, toss it over to Rick Gilbert to answer that question, please. Yes, the answer is yes, we will take those. Great. Thank you, Jim, for the question. And thank you, Rick, for that short, concise answer. <laughs> uh, next question is from uh, Beverly Parsons. Uh, Beverly has uh, written, you mentioned lead silver as a minimum. Could you comment on what differences there would be in the design if you were using lead gold? Sure. Uh, that that is the million dollar question right now, and we are we are working on a little bit of a a matrix to to see uh, what what we can get and what we can't get. And one of the tough the tough trade offs is um, we always, as a basis of design, design to that lead silver standard, which which is very high design it's it wouldn't be a lead certified it would it would be a level above that of sustainability lead silver lead gold gets a little harder to to attain design gets a little more complex and thus a little more costly and the building tends to get a little more costly as well so it's it's actually a bit of a loaded question right now we're we're working through some of those systems that we we can easily achieve and then looking at some of the things that are a little more difficult. And one of the things that is difficult is uh, the remoteness. And when you have a remote site, there are a lead is, is one of those systems that we think is a little bit flawed in this kind of scenario, because a lot of the credits that you can normally get with a, with a lead gold or lead platinum are very much dependent on a, a more, um, uh, more connected to the context. So, um, you know, higher efficiency heating and cooling uh, are, are one thing. Rainwater harvesting is another thing that we're looking at. Obviously, solar and the amount that we can, that we can achieve there. Uh, materiality, sourcing of, ma of materials. Um, those types of things are all things that we consider, but but when we when we really start doing the math, we we haven't quite figured out what path we can present to to show the delta between where we would normally have our basis of design and and the gold level. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm being elusive about that. It's just we we haven't quite got there yet. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, Beverly, for that question. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to read a question that Martha Burke had submitted and Commissioner Gelder uh, typed in uh, an answer. Uh, Martha asked a question, what is the current zoning for this site? And the answer to that is this is zoned as a local area of more intensive rural development dash rural commercial. Um, thank you for that question, Martha. And uh, Commissioner Gelder, appreciate you uh, providing an answer on that one. Uh, next up, we are going to go to uh, David Musgrove. Uh, David types, thank you for the opportunity to catch up with the progress. A quick overview of the types of waste that will be accepted would be helpful. Separately, an overview of the services provided or function from this site. Um, and so as far as the waste that will be accepted, uh, Rick, do you want to um, take that question? Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to follow up in writing. Um, 
if they wanted to get in touch with me. Uh, everything, everything that's collected at our current Hansville Recycling and Garbage Facility in terms of HHW household hazardous waste would be taken. So that's used oil, antifreeze, household batteries, automotive batteries, sharps, and fluorescent lamps. Um, one of the most common items that we get is paint. So we'll be taking paint, um, oil-based and latex paint both. Um, we take just any household item that you might be reluctant to throw in the garbage that might have chemicals in it. So things, flammable liquids, um, like, you know, old lawnmower gas, paint thinner, things like that. Um, pesticides, the county always encourages people to use less pesticides, but we, you know, still, people still have those. So we, we take um, yard chemicals like weed and feed and 2,4-D and other chemicals, um, corrosive cleaners, um, and then a lot of the, you know, it's less common items like mole killers. Um, trying to think of any other items off the top of my head, but um, I'm happy to provide a more comprehensive list um, if, if anybody needs it or wants it. Hey, Rick. Uh, and then the second part of the question is separately an overview of services provided or function from this facility. Jacques, do you wanna take that sure. question? So we've spoken a lot about the household hazardous, hazardous waste collection facility. The, the road operations facility will service the, the road maintenance crews. And so uh, the road maintenance crews maintain all of our existing roadways. We, we pave road surfaces, we chip seal road surfaces, they, they complete shoulder maintenance, uh, they re-excavate uh, roadside ditches so that they have capacity to handle uh, water off the off the road surfaces. Um, we do vegetation management, uh, snow control during the winter. Um, it'll be that group that uh, is housed here, along with the mechanics that maintain all the various pieces of equipment and the vehicles that we use to do that work. So that that's what'll be uh, in that uh, uh, the bigger building. Great. Thank you, Jacques and uh, Rick. Appreciate it. Um, David, thank you for that question. I'm going to go over to Bruce again. Bruce has uh, raised his hand. So, Bruce, I'm going to unmute you, and you should be able to uh, unmute your microphone and speak. Thank you. I, this is a very simple question, but when talking about your administrative building, there was talk about having in-floor heat, uh, in the um, shop area or the repair area. Um, but uh, con considering um, the kind of weather we had last summer, what kind of air conditioning will you have uh, for the, uh, that, the building? That's a great question. Um, and we are, we're, we're working on that as well. Um, there, there's actually a system that we have discussed a little bit about in-floor radiant cooling as well, uh, as well as a system to keep air moving, you know, just making sure that our ventilation is, is, uh, is on high, uh, high, high turnover to keep air moving, which is a lot more comfortable. Um, the other thing is all of the, the, the glazing that we've talked about is all insulated and we're going to be insulating some of the interior walls as well to try to keep the to keep the heat load and that cooling load as as reasonable as we can while those doors are opening and closing for for maintenance. Great, right, thank you, Steve and uh, Bruce. Thank you for that question. Uh, okay, we're going to go to uh, Beverly Parsons, and she is asking, will you have electric charging stations for employees with electric vehicles and or for the public to use? Will any of the vehicles being used by the service center be electric vehicles? I, I can speak to this. Um, we, will, we, we will be installing some charging stations, not for the public, but for our own employees. Um, the operations facility is gonna be very active with large equipment, uh, large vehicles. So uh, we don't envision public interaction on that site. 
Um, but we will have charging stations for uh, vehicles at this time, a few stations, but we're, we're intending to install the infrastructure to add stations as that technology um, comes around. And as you know, um, or you probably know, there's a push for vehicle electric vehicles uh, to be the standard by 2030. Um, it's a little bit behind right now. Um, they are uh, working on the technology to supply elect electric vehicles for the heavy equipment that we operate, the large trucks. So it's all coming down the pipeline. So we're planning for it. Um, we intend to have, like I said, a couple for our smaller vehicles to start with the infrastructure to, to expand as that industry uh, evolves. Great. Thank you, Jock. Okay, uh, we have, um, uh, let's see. Next question is, uh, Reed Blanchard, would you mind describing in more detail how wetland C will be hydrated as was mentioned in the presentation? Uh, Jeff or Steve, do you want to take that? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that. Uh, so this is an excerpt from our drainage report. Uh, and so like I mentioned earlier, wetland C is down here. And we've got these two basins labeled TDA1 and 2. As you can see, TDA2 uh, drains uh, the basin that flows into this unnamed uh, tributary of Campbell Creek. Uh, but Wetland C is a bit isolated, but uh, we show the existing flows that currently come into the site here and exit to the south. And so um, the storm sewer system that we're putting together has culverts to maintain that flow that flows currently through the site. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Beverly Parsons has another question, and that is, will the SEPA environmental reviews be available for public review? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take a shot at that, uh, Jeff Massey. So yes, it is required. I mean, the State Environmental Policy Act requires that uh, the SEPA checklist and other documentation associated with that is published uh, and is open for, I believe, a 30-day public review period. So yes, it will be available for review once that is posted. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Margaret Tuft is asking, you spoke about the cleaning of trucks. Where will the wash water go? Will the drainage waste be protected from spillage? Uh, yeah, I could go ahead and take that one. Um, so I'm going back here. What we've shown on our site plan is the fuel station over here. Excuse me, uh, the wash rack. Um, so yes, uh, our, our mechanical electrical plumbing consultant is P2S Incorporated. Uh, so they have scoped to specify a a recycling type of facility. Uh, so the water, much like you see it, like brown bear car wash, so to speak. I'm not an expert on this, but I do know the recycling uh, will reuse that water. It settles out the contaminants and sediments and that type of thing. And uh, the sediments and contaminants will be reduced down in size where they can be ultimately disposed of through say a back to truck and, and that type of thing. So yes, uh, we, uh, this site does not have sanitary sewer. Uh, so for uh, uh, basically to take care of waste from bathrooms and other facilities, we are proposing a septic onsite septic service uh, sewer system. Uh, but when it comes to the truck wash, again, consolidate the sediments and contaminants that come from that wash water and dispose of it in the appropriate fashion. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Margaret, for that question. Wait, let uh, me, Jack, go ahead. I just want to add to that. So, um, Reed, we have closed loop recycle systems at two of our current road shops. 
And so it does, it does reuse the water. And like Jeff said, we have our vector trucks come in on a regular basis and they, they, uh, they suck up the solids from a, uh, a sump and they take it to our decant facility out at the central Kitsap treatment plant. And so that, uh, that material is decanted into the sewer system. And then the, the solids are disposed of out at the, uh, at the transfer, transfer station. So it'll be a similar type operation here. Thank you, Jock. Uh, there's a couple of questions that were answered by um, um, county staff and Commissioner Gelder. I just wanna read those for the folks that are joining by phone. Uh, Jim Grow asks a question, will you accept small propane canisters for, uh, for typical camp stoves? And the answer to that is yes. Um, and uh, Sharice Graham asked the question, are you planning to bring in city water and sewer? If yes, will it be made available to the surrounding neighborhoods? Um, and uh, Commissioner Gelder typed in that uh, KPUD water will be available to the site. Sewer is not available to the site, uh, nor would it be due to prohibitions from the State Growth Management Act. And as Jeff mentioned, it will be an on-site septic. Um, and I'm just looking at the rest of the questions right now. I'm not doing any other open from Reed. Question from Reed. Yeah, let's do some of the ones see it. Bear with me. I'm just checking to make sure we don't have any uh, questions. Uh, uh, here's uh, a question that Reed asked earlier. Uh, in our previous public meeting, additional development adjacent to the North Kitsap Service Center to the southwest of the facility was mentioned. Do you have an update on this development? Um, and uh, Commissioner Elder uh, replied uh, with uh, no respect with DCD and Suquamish Tribe. There are no permit applications at the moment, and Chairman Forsman has shared that there are no specific plans at this time. Um, thank you, Reed, for that question, and thank you, Commissioner Gelder, for uh, replying to, to Reed. Um, at this time, I am not showing any open questions either in the chat, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the Q&A box, or I don't see any, uh, any folks with the, with the raised hand. Um, so, uh, unless anybody has anything else to add, I'll just, uh, I'll close on my side with, uh, just reminding you of our project webpage and all the information that's there to inform you of the project and what we've done to date. Um, also want to, uh, offer my phone number, uh, and or email, um, uh, feel free to get a hold of me, uh, to answer questions, uh, the, to, uh, if you have any other questions about the project, I'd be free to uh, and willing to talk to you about it and share what I know. Thank, Thank you for you. attending the meeting. Thank you, Jeff. At this time, uh, seeing that there are no further questions, we're going to close the meeting. and would like to thank uh, all the panelists for joining us. And, and the, uh, whoops, I spoke too soon. Um, we got a couple more questions that just popped up. Uh, uh, Carolyn Zimmers asked the question, will you accept metal? Um, Rick, do you want to take that question, please? No, we won't be. The, the facility is just going to accept household hazardous waste. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And Beverly has uh, graciously said thanks for providing this update, and you are most welcome. A um, couple more questions popping in. Uh, Jim Grove, thanks for offering this meeting to the public. I'm anxious to see to use this facility and avoid the drive to the airport. Absolutely, that's uh, uh, that's one of our one of our goals with the project. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Carolyn Zimmers has uh, another question about appliances. Will you accept appliances? And uh, uh, Rick, do you want to take that one as well? No, unfortunately, we won't. I know some appliances have. Um you know, coolant and stuff, but we do accept them at our Hansville location, which is not too far away. It's not, it's not a drive to the airport, but um, yeah, we won't be taking appliances there because we do have it available. Anyway. Okay. Thank you, Rick. 
again, thank you to the panelists and thank you for all the attendees uh, that joined us for this meeting. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, um, as Jeff mentioned, we will have uh, three more public uh, open house meetings uh, uh, in, the, in the future. So we look forward to sharing updates as the project progresses. Um, at this time, I'm going to end the meeting and wish everybody a good evening and we'll see you uh, at the next, the next update meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.